The first time I played Death Stranding, there were a lot of details that got me confused because almost everything about it is highly original. But now, things are much clearer in my mind, and in this video, I'm going to share with you some of those confounding questions that I eventually found answers for. Just a quick heads up that there are very few established facts in DS1 because their post-stranding world is still relatively new. Most of the things we know are theories proposed by in-game characters and mixed in with my observations. Therefore, they are subject to change depending on what we'll learn from the upcoming sequel. Alright, let's do this. Number 1. What is Death Stranding? Prior to the world-changing event, a deceased person's soul, called Ka, automatically separates from their body, known as Ha, which then moves on to the afterlife. When the DS began, people eventually learned that this journey included two more steps. From the world of the living, a soul passes through the seam first, then to the beach, and from there they head towards the afterlife. More importantly, the DS also retains the connection between body and soul, even if an individual is already gone. So instead of moving to that final place, a Ka will get stuck on the beach, and unless their connection is cut within 48 hours, the deceased shall undergo necrosis, transforming them into a beach thing, or BT for short. This bond between Ha and Ka seems to be factual, seeing how effective we can sever links by incinerating bodies. We can also see clear evidence of this with what happened to Hartman's family, who along with other people got caught in a void out. Since all matter is obliterated in such an explosion, there are no more bodies to which they are tethered to, so their souls automatically move on. It's a major change to their world where the natural process of passing away has been suspended because souls get marooned on the beach by default, hence the name Death Stranding. Number 2. BT is a broad term. From item 1, we know that BTs are fallen people who necrotized. But the creatures Higgs summoned, and other similar ones that Sam has to fight or run away from on occasion, are also referred to as such. So what's going on there? It's important to remember that only human beings can undergo necrosis. That's why in heavy timefall areas, their souls are the only ones we see. In my opinion, BT has become an umbrella term for any entity that emerges from TAR. But on a technical basis, only people can be tagged with that classification, and the other ones are called chiral creatures. In relation to this, you might also be wondering about what happens during necrotization. From what's observable, it seems that a necrotized body becomes part of the tar, and their soul, that's still connected to it, is left hovering in the land of the living. This is why every time they detect a person, the handprints they leave behind always have a pool of tar, because they're using that substance as a means to interface with living creatures. Number 3. Bridget's Timefall An early mission in the game involves delivering Bridget's body to the incinerator, and upon doing so, this happened. Chiralium density in the area is climbing rapidly. Heavy timefall is imminent. Get back here, now! With that in mind, I expected that the same thing would probably happen if I had to do another corpse disposal, but it didn't. There was no increase in chiralium density, no timefall. I thought that was quite odd, but it turns out the answer to this question can be found in this cutscene, where we learn that Bridget's cells were teeming with chiralium. So it's no wonder that happened when we burned her body. She's partially made of that stuff. Number 4. Expedition Confusion The first time I played this game, I was disoriented by the information surrounding this coordinated journey to the west. But now, it's much clearer and here are the details. The first expedition happened three years before DS1, and we actually have a cutscene that visualizes this. 
However, the problem with this projection is that we only see a single group, when in fact, the first expedition was composed of two. In group 1, we have Amelie, who conversed with local community leaders to join the UCA, as well as Bridges staffers who built the way stations and distribution centers, if an agreement was made. Group 2, meanwhile, was composed of Bridges members who are tasked with manning those structures. So everyone who Sam talked to, such as Victor Frank, Malingan and Lochna, Philip North, and Hartsman were all part of that. After those were established, the second expedition was then tasked with carrying the Cupid to connect those buildings with the Cairo network. It took three years after the first expedition because there were several issues. First, Amelie never made a return trip because she got captured in Edgenot City. That's the cover story anyway. Second, the research surrounding Cupid technology was not yet complete. According to this interview from Di Hardman, the successful test for it was conducted a year before the events of DS-1, and by then Sam was still off the grid. By the way, this trio composed of him, Igor Frank, and the unnamed driver were the members of the second expedition, and we all know what happened shortly after they teamed up. Number 5. London Bridges In several of the cutscenes where Sam visits the beach in his sleep, we can hear Amelie singing London Bridge, and initially I didn't understand what that meant. It turns out, according to this interview from Dead Man titled Human Sacrifices Under London Bridge, there's a dark interpretation of that nursery song, where the fair lady mentioned in its lyrics was a human sacrifice to keep the bridge from collapsing. By the end of DS1, this is essentially what happened. She sacrificed herself by preventing the last stranding and allowed bridges to continue their intended purpose. Maybe a part of her knew that this is what would eventually happen, which is not surprising because the extinction entity could see into many futures. I had so many dreams of the future. I didn't know which ones to trust. For item number 6, I would like to give a shout out to Abdo Malik, who pointed out a possible reason as to why Sam's hair turned gray in the S2's trailer 1. Initially, I didn't have a clue as to why it happened, but then Abdo Malik left a comment that this conversation between Sam and Deadman may have something to do with it. We looked for a month with absolutely nothing to show for it. A month on the outside. How long on the inside? Trust me when I tell you, you don't want to know. But don't worry, we found no signs of accelerated aging. At first it may seem that Sam's accelerated time exposure is a non-issue. But in my opinion, there's a high probability that Sam did suffer from it after all. Somewhat similar to what happened with Solid Snake from the Metal Gear series. Maybe it's an accelerated time that's slow enough not to notice any immediate changes but sufficiently fast that his hair turned gray by the time the S2 rolls out. Other than a natural passage of time or exposure to timefall, the story does not present any other possible reason as to why this would happen, so this was a good catch. This brings us to item number 7, the beach's time conundrum. The widely accepted theory is that time does not move on the beach. Even Hartman, who's been there a lot, and is responsible for its research, said this. Time stops on the beach, but not in the scene. If that's the case, then how can a place where time doesn't move be responsible for a phenomena that accelerates it? It doesn't make sense. So my hypothesis is that the reason why time doesn't move there is because the beach represents the end of time. This concept is not unheard of. Divinity Original Sin, for example, has something similar. If we look at this puzzle through that lens, then the effects of time fall and Sam's possible rapid aging can now easily be grasped. In terms of the chiral network that's also centered around the beach, it would be similar to having a wireless internet connection on steroids, where the upload and download processes have already been done beforehand which is why anything that passes through the network is instantaneous. 
Once you connect it to the terminal, you'll be able to initiate zero-time massive data transmission with the UCA network. So there we have it, seven story details surrounding Death Stranding explained. If you have any questions about the game, let me know in the comments section and I'll see if I can answer them for you.